Hey everybody, welcome back to our next video, our next chapter in our ongoing exploration of the story by Randy Frazee. Glad to be back again. This week we are looking at chapter 18, which is entitled Daniel in Exile. Now this chapter, everything that we find here within the book is uh, taken from the, uh, the larger Old Testament book of Daniel. Daniel itself as a whole, which is about 12 chapters long, is an interesting mix of both narration as well as some prophetic imagery. Now, what's a little bit different about Daniel compared with some of the other prophetic books that we have is uh, that it really is more narration, even narration about some of the prophetic imagery that we hear. So it's definitely like we've we've sort of been in this mode of, of a little bit of both narrative and prophetic uh, for the last couple of chapters. And this time we still have that, but it it skews itself more narrative based, if that makes sense. So that's just kind of an observation of the way that Daniel as a whole is presented. Admittedly, there's some weird stuff in there too. Uh, I think a lot of people are familiar with some of the high points of, uh, of Daniel, for instance, the lion's den and the fiery furnace. Uh, those are uh, two things, and I'll talk about those a little bit more in a moment. But there's a lot of imagery in there, especially in the later chapters, but kind of the back half of, of the, the book as a whole that is, is some wild stuff. So if you ever get into Daniel, just be aware that there's some wild stuff in there. Historical setting, let's talk about this. Daniel takes place during the period of the Babylonian exile. Now, Daniel, Jewish name, by the way, and his three companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those are the Babylonian names, uh, there is a switch that happens for all four of them. And for whatever reason, Daniel, we're more used to hearing his Jewish name, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we are more used to hearing their their uh, Babylonian given names, but but those are their names. And they are among the first group taken into exile. If you remember this from last week, the last chapter, there were actually two periods uh, when individuals from Judah were hauled off into exile and they were among the first group. Daniel seemingly lives all the way through the Babylonian exile or that, that period, which was about 60-ish years and even into the Persian rule. Uh, so it's roughly a 70 year time period that he is in and around Babylon. Now we don't know exactly how old he and the other three were when they were taken into exile. Likely they were teenagers um, or you know preteens even. Uh, but uh, so, so Daniel seemingly lived a pretty long time. The other three, we don't exactly know. Their story kind of tapers off and we don't necessarily hear about what happens to them. Ultimately, we don't actually know what happens to any of the four, but some people believe, tradition kind of has been led to believe that Daniel was eventually killed by a jealous fellow courtesan officer. So uh, uh, he, uh, as we hear, has a lot of prestige and eventually somebody got mad at him and killed him. But we don't know. We're not actually given uh, the basis for what may have happened. Um, the events that are depicted within the book of Daniel correspond with some of the other prophetic writings and settings that we already have, uh, as well as some of what's coming up, uh, including what we heard from Jeremiah last week. Uh, also, some of the next couple of chapters, which would, will include the, the story of Esther, if you're familiar with that one, all of these uh, kind of sort of correspond. So we're into a section that is sort of a story over here and a story over here and a story over here, all because of Daniel's apparent longevity. Uh, he covered a fair amount of this historical period. Um, in many ways, uh, the book of Daniel, the stories that we hear within Daniel and the experience of all four of the guys really speak to the direction that we heard last week, sort of the, the encouragement that came through Jeremiah of get comfortable because you're going to be here for a while. Um, Daniel also serves as an example of the reality that some of the exiles stay put when the Persian Empire rose to prominence and allowed the people to go back to Jerusalem. Uh, he kind of was around during that, that time of transition and he stayed put. Uh, this is something that we know of what's called the diaspora, which was the, the Jewish culture kind of spreading throughout the known world because of these various exiles that some of the people went back after a couple of generations uh, and some people stayed put because they had been born in this this area. They had lived their entire lives. That's what they knew, so they stayed there. And Daniel's kind of an example of that. Um, we have some 
echoes of some earlier stories, some earlier individuals. Now, this is something that we bumped into before. Uh, we tend to, to have these type of echoes that kind of come up and we hear some similarities. That definitely happens again. Now, we hear about God granting wisdom and understanding to all four of the guys. Uh, that sounds a lot like Solomon. If you remember the beginning of Solomon's story, when he becomes king initially, uh, he asks God for wisdom, make me wise, and God does so. Uh, same sort of thing happens uh, with these four individuals. We find a story of divine favor and divine gifts, allowing all four of the individuals to endure and overcome life-threatening circumstances. Uh, for instance, the fiery furnace for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the lion's den for Daniel, the execution of the wise men for all four of them. Um, and uh, we also hear about uh, elevation to positions of power and authority and prestige. And all of this sounds a lot like Joseph. Also, side note, the ability to, to interpret G, uh, dreams also sounds a lot like Joseph. So, uh, and, and Joseph, in many ways, was in exile in Egypt. So we definitely have echoes of Joseph's story in that situation. Um, for Daniel, this sort of thing seems to happen multiple times under different rulers where uh, he rises to prestige and then somebody gets threatened by it. So they kind of try and throw him under the bus and uh, there's a danger to his life and uh, God divine favor overcomes it. And Daniel then is elevated again, kind of seems to happen multiple times. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, there's some prophetic foreshadowing that goes on in uh, terms of the dream of Nebuchadnezzar and the statue made of different materials. Uh, that uh, that uh, is prophetic. Look at the rise and the fall of various empires, one after another after another through the ages. Now, we've sort of already seen this and we've kind of already talked about this. The Assyrian Empire has already risen to prominence and then fallen away as the Babylonians have come to power. That has already happened by this point. And we'll also see the Persian Empire comes up after the Babylonians and we have the Greek Empire and we have the Roman Empire. So it kind of, it's one after another after another. This is sort of a repeat, but it's this prophetic look that actually goes to the ruler. Nebuchadnezzar was the king or the emperor at the time. And uh, he receives that as well. Uh, we also see a little bit of the same kind of thing when the uh, divine hand of God seemingly shows up uh, regarding uh, Belshazzar. That's a weird name. Uh, and he didn't last real long. So, uh, so he mocked God and mocked Daniel and it didn't go well for him. So we kind of see some of those things. Now, I'm not going to really get into all the various stories. I'm going to let you discuss those if you want to. There's some great stuff in there. And so I hope you do. As I wrap this up, I'm going to shift into the things that make me go, hmm, uh, not necessarily things that are problematic this time. You know, sometimes I, I will share things that, that don't sit real well with me and I don't quite know what to make them. Uh, but these are more things that make me go, hmm, based on observation. Uh, this liter literature that stems from the Babylonian captivity points out a difference that I have come to see or uh, become aware of between um, Jewish understanding and present day Christian understandings about the promises of God. Now, I want to give a little side note preface, uh, a disclaimer to this. I do not claim to be an expert on Jewish theology. Um, and uh, like Christian theology has so many different branches and so many different uh, uh, directions you can go. I also, it's my, my understanding that Jewish uh, theology is is the same way that there are many many different trains of thought within that but i do get the sense uh, again based on observation and things that i've read that uh, there is a very real prominent difference between the jewish understanding of the promises of god being communal for the people and and our christian understanding or definitely our present day christian understanding where things are much more personal in nature um, a word on that within the Jewish understanding, again, by my observation or by my understanding at this moment, is that it is communal. The promises of God are for the people, for the culture, and not necessarily for the individual. Uh, we see this uh, as kind of an idea that there is a, a hope of a future fulfillment of this, even if I don't live to see it. Uh, several examples. The period in Egypt between Genesis and Exodus, 400 years of the people crying out to God for deliverance. Um, the promise to the exiles that you will return that we just heard about last week. And uh, even their understanding, the Jewish understanding of the Messiah. 
um, different than our understanding of the Messiah. So this it's this future fulfillment for the people uh, as a whole. Uh, so it's much more communal in nature. Now we tend to look at things on much more of a personal basis. This is for you, this is for me. And um, I think that probably resonates more deeply for us in our understanding than this idea that this is for everyone. Now. We also have that communal uh, that communal understanding, but we have a much more personal look at it. So uh, again, just some things, some observations, some things that make me go hmm. And uh, and Daniel is a really good example of that, given his proximity through this period of history in which three generations came and went, and uh, um, waiting for this future promise. That's everything I have. Hope you have a great discussion, and we will be back again next week. Thanks, everybody.